chat feature and the Q&A feature within Whova. We do have the Zoom chat open, but if you keep them within Whova, you'll be able to go back and revisit them over time uh, for the next couple of weeks. And just give us a shout if you have any questions or need any assistance. I'm going to wait just one more minute. I know some people in some part of the world were uh, taking a break to get some food. Okay, uh, let's get going. This is a, a symposium uh, 13, Mushrooming uh, Community Science and Sharing Biodiversity Data. And this is a, an exciting symposium for me because I've been coming to Tadwig meetings for many, many years now, and I don't remember one devoted to, to mushrooms or fungi in general. So here's our, our third kingdom that's often ignored and, and we're having our first symposium. It's a modest start, but we have people from around the world who are going to share things that are going on in their countries. And that's uh, start to get the global perspective. Um, I want to, uh, I want to um, uh, tell the speakers that uh, we have uh, 15 minutes, although our last speaker is a pre-recorded session. So um, we're, uh, we have uh, uh, 15 minutes total and I'll let you speak for about 13 and give you a three minute reminder. Um, and then um, we can stop and have uh, questions for a couple minutes and then proceed to the next speaker. And then after everybody's gone, we still have 15 minutes to, to have a more general discussion uh, about the, uh, how, how biodiversity standards might grow the, the sharing of data in the mushroom community. Um, and I think with that, unless there's other notes, oh, except uh, I just want to remind people because this is an international community and English is uh, not everybody's first language that we should try to speak more slowly. I'm, I'm not necessarily doing a good job of that, but hopefully the speakers will. Alrighty, I'm gonna stop sharing. And our first speaker is Tom May, and he's going to speak to us about mushrooming in Australia.
Good morning. Uh, thank you, Rob, and thanks for the invitation to speak. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, from which I'm speaking, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and uh, pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, I'm going to be talking about the use of target species in citizen science fungi recording schemes. Uh, I'm going to talk about the data that that creates and then at the end, consider how that might relate to standards and so on. But most of what I'm going to be talking about is the generation of data. So why did we start FungiMap? Well, back in 1995, uh, we had a very poor knowledge base uh, for fungi distribution. Uh, when I took uh, a, a common uh, species of Australian fungus, Mycena interruptor, or what seemed common to me, and a very distinctive looking fungus. And I looked at how many specimens we had in the herbarium. There were only two specimens from uh, the state of Victoria in the herbarium, despite the fact that this species had been described uh, well over 100 years before and was very distinctive. Uh, I then looked into the literature and I found that I could find some literature records, but it was very time consuming to locate and compile these records. And I had to calculate the latitude and longitude for each one as well. So we got together with our local field naturalist club and ran a pilot scheme for a couple of years. And you can see in the lower corner here, these are the records that came in from that fungi map scheme just in a, about a five year period. And there was almost 300 records. So the mapping scheme really took off and we we're able to go from these couple of dots on the map right through to having quite a lot of dots on the map quite quickly. So it seemed worthwhile ex expanding. And fungi map commenced in 1995 as a mapping scheme for eight iconic species of Australian macrofungi. And that set of species is now extended to 200. Fungi Maps evolved into an NGO a community group for fungi across Australia, and its activities extend to networking, education, and advocacy. But the mapping scheme is still a core part of Fungi Map. One of the key things about the mapping scheme was the production of guides, newsletters, and so on. And particularly this book, Fungi Down Under, published in 2005, that was a field guide to the first 100 target species. And I believe it was one of the first field guides to fungi around the world to include maps. And this was key to people being able to identify the target species and being stimulated to fill in uh, spots on the map. Now, the characteristics of target species are that they are readily recognised in the field. So they have to be identifiable. Uh, many of them stand out by their bright colours and unusual shapes, the blue Mycena interrupter, uh, the weirdness of the uh, anemone stinkhorn, uh, the interesting spines on this pseudohydnum. We had some information on the taxon concept. I wouldn't say that for every species, the taxonomy had been fully worked out, but at least someone had had a bit of a look to make sure that it was a distinct species and probably in the right genus. Before we had the field guide fungi down under, we also needed to have images available. And at that point, that was in, in book field guides. Now, one of the key things about target species is that, is that most of them we deliberately chose to be common and widespread because we wanted recorders to have a really good chance of coming across them, but we did slip in a few rare species. And I'll talk to the importance of that later. We also thought that it was ideal to stratify that set of target species by geography, habitats, hosts and substrates, again, to make sure that people in different parts of Australia had a chance of seeing them and that there were coverage of desert, rainforest, woodland and so on. And we also made a selection of what we call morpho groups. So these are the different forms like puffballs, bracket fungi, mushrooms and so on, uh, and of major genera. And so down here, we have a number of species from different uh, habitats. This is a tropical rainforest species, Coquina. The Padaxis is out in the desert. This Gloeophyllum concentricum was a rare species at that time, found only in tropical Australia. 
Now, since uh, the recording scheme started in the, in the 1990s, those observational records of fungi have really mushroomed. So this is the data in the Atlas of Living Australia, and this is sent to GBIF, so you'd have essentially the same pattern there. Uh, the uh, red colour there is the specimen-based data and the blue is the observation. So very quickly with the um, commencement of fungi map, we had a really big increase in the amount of observational data. And you'll notice in recent years, there's a decrease generally in the amount of specimens. Um, so this observational data is becoming quite important. Now, one of the key things I think about a mapping scheme that I've kind of realised uh, uh, a long way after starting it is that maps make species real. So when we just had one or two dots on the map for fungi and when talking to policymakers and managers and indeed other scientists, people used to think we didn't know anything about fungi. What could you know? You just had one specimen here, they were hard to find. And it was like they weren't real. And, and people used to say, well, how do you even know what a species is in fungi? Well, I mean, that's just the same problem as for any group of the biota from, from an evolutionary point of view. But there was this sense that fungi weren't real and we could they weren't tractable. So once you have a map, and this is a map that uh, was part of the Australia's State of the Environment reporting, uh, once you have a map with lots of dots on it, it makes that species real. This is a map here of Mycena interrupter, the blue pixies parasol, uh, against a rainfall layer. And so having maps with thousands of points on them shows that fungi are just like other organisms. They have distributions, they have preferences for habitat. You can model them, you can investigate them. So I think having maps of well-known species is really important. For, for us as mycologists, but for a much broader point uh, of view as well. Now, when we look at fungi distribution data, uh, okay, we've got these species that we now know quite well, but in general, uh, fungi distribution data is complicated by a number of issues. Those issues include names and taxon concepts. So in Australia, we don't have an up-to-date census for fungi. Uh, names change for various reasons. There's not a way of keeping track of that in real time. We have exotic species. Uh, if you're trying to do assessments of vegetation quality and so on, or threat assessments and so on, it's important to be able to separate out the exotic species. And we can't do that at the moment because we don't have a complete trait database, not only of things like whether species are native or exotic, but all the different characters that you might want to discuss like the morpho groups or uh, their mycorrhizal status and so on. The, these trait databases are beginning to be populated, but certainly not complete. Just like with any uh, distribution data, there's lots of errors in geocoding. That's not really specific to fungi, but misidentifications is, is something that is at a very high rate in fungi. And on the citizen science platforms, it's a constant battle to be correcting uh, the misidentifications. And just to sort of drill down to one example, this is iNaturalist. This is the observations of, of Rushula as a genus on iNaturalist. We can see the total observations from Australia. There's about three and a half thousand observations. Those that are, research, that are not research grade, that is they haven't been conserved, confirmed by two people. It's about 80% of those records haven't even been confirmed to species or that two people can agree on which species it is. And I think it's like, I see it like the ocean. There's a sort of the records that we can use floating on the top and there's just this massive amount of data that's just drifting down to fall on the bottom of the ocean that may never be recoverable. It's a bycatch that we, it's the price of being able to record at scale. And it may not matter if 50% if of the data is never usable, but it's very messy. And uh, there are a lot of, um, observations that are both not identified and many that will never be identifiable um, just because the photo doesn't show the characters that are, that are needed. Maybe with, with AI in time, we can extract more data, but at the moment, uh, it's quite messy. Now, thinking about the benefit of target species in dealing with this um, rather messy situation, for recorders, it's an entry into what can be a rather bewildering world of, of fungi names and identification. 
The target species set is a primer for fungi structure and function covering different groups. And we have a curated set of species uh, that have numerous records for analysis. So it moves fungi from the difficult to the tractable for fields such as modeling, management and policy. Uh, records of target species are also useful for threat assessments uh, and particularly because we can calibrate, say we have a rare species such as this Hypocreopsis amplectans that's red listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list. Uh, we were able to make the case for that because the very few records we had were from a species included in the, in the mapping scheme and consequently it wasn't just that it was overlooked, people had been looking but only been able to find a few records. Now, there are some challenges around uh, the use of target species. One is the need to adjust the list for the changes in taxon concepts, things like generic placement, but also species circumscription. So sometimes target species are split over time. I think there's an interesting feedback loop there between uh, species limits and the availability of data. So there's a constant interaction between the, these are species for which we have a lot of data, so they should be priorities for, for taxonomy. Uh, informal names are out there, you could call them tag or field names, they're a little bit more difficult to manage because they're informal, they're not code um, covered by the code. And there's also um, uh, difficulties now about communicating with recorders about target species sets because we're moving from what I'll call closed to open systems and I'll show that on the next slide. And there's a challenge in growing the target species sets to continue engagement. So in um, terms of closed versus open, yep. We got to be careful about time here, okay? Yep, just about there. Okay. So when we started FungiMap, the records came into the office and they were dealt with in an internal database. Now we use iNaturalist. We don't actually control for that set of target species. We accept all records of species. I'll flip that. And the final slide is, I'll just mention the potential, and this is really where it gets back to data standards and the use of data the potential to integrate curated target species lists into data cleaning pipelines. So recently, Tian Xiaohao has developed a, a, a pipeline for cleaning fungi data. And you'll see for Australia, we've, the, the cleaning's reduced a million records down to a quarter of a million records. And there's a potential to use sets of target species to further filter that, to have species for which we're really clear about the taxonomic boundaries. Thanks to Tian Zhao and Russell for analysis and to the fungi map recorders across Australia who've contributed more than 120,000 records of Australian macrofungi. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was very exciting for me and I hope others enjoyed it as much. The challenge of uh, taxonomy is in fungi is like the challenge everywhere, except not so much is known yet. So there's more progress to be made. Um, We've, um, we've used up the 15 minutes allotted for your uh, presentation, but you've given us lots to think about. So we'll, we'll save that for the last discussion. Uh, up next is um, uh, uh, Bill Sheehan, who's gonna talk about Fundus, which is um, a, uh, an effort here in the United States that Bill has organized and spearheaded an entirely volunteer organization to work on conservation of, of uh, Fungi, fungi in North America. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Rob. Let, let me know if I'm sharing my screen. Is that working? It is. OK. Well, greetings, everybody. And thanks to Tadwig and the University of Florida for hosting this meeting. Uh, I'm going to talk about Fungal Diversity Survey, or FUNDUS for short. Uh, as Rob mentioned, we're an all-volunteer, nonprofit community science organization. We were founded in 2017 as the North American Mycoflora Project. We recently dropped the mycoflora because fungi are a separate kingdom, more closely related to animals than to plants, in fact. Fungi are one of three major kingdoms of multi multicellular life on Earth. So our mission is to increase scientific knowledge and public awareness of the critical role of fungi in the health of our ecosystems and to better utilize and protect them 
in a world of rapid climate change and habitat loss. We do this by equipping community scientists working with professional mycologists with the reporting tools to document the diversity and distribution of fungi across North America. In 2020, we narrowed our focus from documenting everything to documenting threatened fungi and crowdsourcing the data needed to protect them. So we are addressing a major gap in biodiversity conservation, fungi. Fungi are ecologically important uh, among other roles. They're essential symbionts with almost all plant species. They're hyper diverse estimates range from 2 million to 12 million species. But fungi are poorly known, probably fewer than 5% have been described. And fungi are threatened by the same forces that are threatening plants and animals, you know, climate change, pollution, habitat loss, invasives, and so forth. So the bottom line is that fungi have been overlooked in conservation. The number of species evaluated for red list status by IUCN is negligible compared with plants and animals. So given the decline in funding for mycology and taxonomy generally, we wondered if amateur mycophiles could crowdsource fungal documentation and discovery and fill that gap. Our engagement model has four levels of increasing information value to science, document, sequence, voucher, and super user. I'm just going to talk about the first three levels here. So we aim to tap into the exploding fascination with fungi, especially among young people, and interest them in contributing to conservation and to science. Engage them in relatively simple tasks, and then gradually involve those who want to do more in increasingly more complex tasks. Level one is document in the field with photos that are geotagged and timestamped and uploaded to the internet. So we have two programs that focus on documenting fungi for conservation. A biodiversity database on iNaturalist and rare fungi challenges. I'll tell you a bit about those. We were inspired by two community science projects abroad. One you just heard about from Tom May, Fungi Map in Aust Australia was the inspiration for our biodiversity database. The Lost and Found Fungi Project in the UK was the inspiration for our rare fungi challenges. It was coordinated by the Kew Royal Botanic Gardens. So our biodiversity database aims to address two critical needs common to all conservation work, getting reliable data and lots of it. Unfortunately, many fungal observations posted to iNaturalist like these are of little use for scientific analysis. And research grade in iNaturalist for fungi is not a reliable indicator of data quality. So we engage triagers, we call them, to flag substandard observations and help beginners post better images and metadata and identifier, identifiers to review observations and correct or provide fungal names. But it also takes massive amounts of data to predict the probability of a species going extinct iNaturalist has close to 5 million observations of fungi, including lichens, now worldwide. The number is almost doubling every year, at least in North America. But that's a long, long way from the 1 billion bird observations logged over two decades by eBird contributors. Even though each individual bird observation is far less robust than our typical fungal observation with photos and sometimes DNA sequences and so forth, a billion of them makes it possible to generate 
over 300 peer-reviewed publications at last, last count. So we've just started vetting uh, fungal observations on iNaturalist and training beginners to make better observations. So far, we have some 56,000 observations in the project. One obstacle is that each observation has to be added to our iNaturalist project one by one by the observer. Uh, if we could figure out mass tagging or importing observations vetted by experts, we could significantly increase the curated database. Our second fungal conservation program is rare fungi challenges. Now, last October, we launched a pilot project for a West Coast of North America rare fungi challenge to find out if we could get people to care about fungal conservation and if amateurs could make scientifically valuable observations. The results were promising. Despite the pandemic and a major drought on the West Coast, seven of 10 target species were found. 91 observations were made by 62 finders. Two major range extensions and several new locations were documented. And importantly, we found that mycophiles are deeply concerned about conservation. So we're continuing the West Coast challenge now with 20 species, and we're about to launch a Northeast rare challenge that will go from Quebec down to Pennsylvania. Now, uh, level two is sequencing DNA, and that's especially important for fungi because they, their vegetative bodies are microscopic filaments in soil, plants, or woods. Our original emphasis back in 2017 was on helping amateurs get their specimens documented online and DNA sequenced or barcoded. Amateurs registered more than 200 local projects across North America, not all for sequencing. And so far, Fundus community scientists have documented and sequenced more than 7,000 specimens with 1,000 more in the queue. Many of the sequenced specimens represent new undescribed species. Some experts think, think that as many as 10 to 20% of sequenced fungal collections of some taxa in North America could be new to science. And this is definitely a motivator for amateur mycophiles. But we've learned a lot about engaging community scientists in sequencing fungi. A major challenge as an all volunteer organization was giving guidance and timely feedback to participants most of whom had little or no scientific tra training. Similarly, relying on volunteers for program administration and specimen tracking led to some service gaps. And finally, making sense of the data generated, the DNA sequences, and determining whether the sequence could be a new species, that requires some really deep professional level knowledge. So the third level is vouchering or saving dried specimens in curated fungaria. Academic mycologists will tell you that everything that is sequenced must be vouchered. And it would be nice if that were possible, but we aim to scale up fund fungal discovery. And especially as high throughput sequencing becomes available and will quickly outpace vouchering capacity in costly curated fungaria, uh, which depend on staff and budgets keep getting cut. And it's a real problem finding uh, stable homes for specimens. Even storage of DNA precipitates in ultra cold freezers is costly. So we need creative new solutions. And who knows, maybe something like preserving spore drops on tinfoil could be a fallback for those specimens that cannot find homes in curated fungaria. Spores contain all the DNA and slips are tiny. Um, another thing might be the, the FDA cards uh, is a way you could store millions of, of uh, vouchers and at least uh, preserve the DNA. 
So this diagram, which I'll just show for a few seconds, uh, shows the automation and tracking systems we'd like to create for our project. But with volunteer programmers, we've only accomplished a part of it. Fundus is currently focused on finding funding for staff and operations and a sustainable business model generally. If we're successful in finding funding, we believe we can bring fungi to the conservation table on a par with plants and animals by mobilizing community scientists. Our plans include expanding rare and habitat challenges, significantly increasing the biodiversity database by orders of magnitude we'd like, sequencing DNA from challenges and local projects, while exploring lower cost, high throughput sequencing and environmental DNA sampling. The end point of all this work is to provide data on threatened species to nature serve natural heritage programs and IUCN red list working groups. We believe that mobilizing an army of community scientists is the best hope for obtaining the data needed to document fundal biodiversity and protect threatened fungi before they go extinct. And I wanna thank all the incredible volunteers that have made Fundus so special. And lastly, to learn more, check out the fundus.org website and you can subscribe to our free newsletter and blog. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That's a great overview of uh, Fundus and um, we have, we have a, a time for a question. Does anybody have a question about uh, the Fundus organization? Um, Bill, we did have a question from Marianne. Where can one access the training material on how to photograph fungi for INAT? Oh, for iNaturalist. We have some resources on our website. Uh, there's actually on the menu, you can see there's something called pho photograph and that's just the basics. And then there's actually, we have more information um, under the menu, I believe called projects. So there's a little video and, and a bunch of information on what's needed for photographing fungi so that they can be useful, uh, be identified and useful to science. Great, and we had actually one more in Hoover. Do you have a protocol to capture fungal hosts in iNaturalist observations? Um, hosts. Well, we we definitely encourage for mycorrhizal fungi. We encourage people to document the habitat and especially step back and take a wide-angle photo, if possible, of the surrounding trees. And of course, for saprobic um, fungi, we want to know what kind of tree they were on, um, and so we. In, in, encourage people to capture both of those kinds of data. All right, thank you. Uh, if there are more questions, of course, we have time at the end and we encourage people to stick with us for the discussion. Next up is uh, Peter Bartlett. Peter's going to talk to us about uh, the use of uh, machine learning for species identification. There's Peter. Hello. We can hear you, that's good. Okay. Oh. Okay. And uh, am, I, am I also sharing my screen? It looks perfect. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the Hebaloma project and uh, in particular my role in it, where we have applied machine learning tools to the problem of species identification within this 
uh, one genus. Uh, quite often when you, you hear about machine learning applied to biodiversity, uh, you hear about image recognition. Indeed, that was the focus of symposium number one, uh, which demoed a lot of uh, fantastic deep networks. Uh, but here we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to look at morphological characteristics only, measure those, and then create the machine learning tool from that. Now, actually, I'm I'm a, I'm a mathematician by background. I'm not a, a, an expert mycologist at all. So, uh, and, and when it comes to Hebeloma in particular, the images of them, they will look kind of similar to me. So uh, I think using, uh, using the, the characteristics on the images is actually a pretty good idea. Um, I, I hope uh, that all the friends and colleagues on this, on this slide I don't mind if I, uh, if I gloss over them a little bit, because a bit push for time, but I just wanted to um, pick out from this slide that the success of the Hebeloma project so far has really been critically dependent on citizen scientists. Uh, it's people who've been collecting Hebeloma in the field, recording their details in a consistent way, and then passing the material on to, to the project team that's listed here. And um, so, yeah, the citizens have been sending their details on the material, uh, and then these have been recorded onto a, onto a custom database. This has evolved over the years. Uh, today it's a biolomics based database for those who know that system and, and it has over 10,000 collections. Now the large majority of those collections have been analyzed in a systematic way, which means to say their location, habitat, any plants are associated with are recorded at the macroscopic level, things like the cap color, number of lamellae, uh, gills are counted under the microscope. The same is done for things like the size and shape of spores and cystidia. And uh, although we're not going to use this information in the species identifier I'm going to talk about, there are also sequences for most collections too. Now, so we, thanks to the collection, we have a lot of measurements. And as experts, my colleagues have used the measurements and, those, and, and the sequences to assign most of the collections to a species. Now, one nice consequence of this is that for the recent species descriptions that we've produced have been generated essentially dynamically by amalgamating collection data directly from our database. But also as well as that, the sort of taxonomically significant characters have sort of naturally been teased out by the, uh, the experts. Uh, so at this point, if you've dabbled with machine learning a little bit, you actually get a little bit excited because you realize that you've got all the ingredients there for what's called a, a supervised classification problem. What the mycologists call characters, uh, the machine learning people call features, but they're the same thing. They're just some measurements that provide hints towards a classification. And it's supervised because we've had experts that have already assigned a classification to, I, I assigned a species to uh, for, for, for some collections that we call the training set. Uh, so then you can apply a machine learning tool that essentially infers a mapping function that probabilistically assigns a collection from those features to the right classification to, to, the, to, the, to the species. Uh, you can then save this mapping function and reuse it and apply it to other collections that were not used as part of training and, and then just see what species the machine uh, thinks it is and use that, that's a testing set for you know, people may recognize the um, terminology. But um, what we've actually done is put that idea onto a website. So hopefully you can see at the moment um, hebeloma.org, which is the, our new website that's basically devoted to exploring the species. And in particular, it has an identifier. So what you can do is you can fill in not really very many um, characters. What I'm actually going to do for the purpose of time, I'm going to, I'm going to type in a collection and get it to autofill. Um, and it's done so here. So where it was found, the only macroscopic uh, character we're using right here is the number of lamellae, and then some information, not all that much really about the spores and chylocystidia. And we can fill that in all on the website and ask it to identify. Um, and it just asking, it, People think about machine learning take, taking hours is actually really quick if you just got one thing to identify. And in this case, uh, it's identified this particular uh, set of characters as 
almost certainly being Ibernium, which is one particular uh, one particular species. And actually, it, it, it really should have done in this case, because this collection that I filled in um, was actually inside that training set. So we sort of said, hey, if you see these features, then it's Ibernium. So we shouldn't be surprised when the machine comes back and says, hey, this is Ibernium. Um, you know, it's parroting the same thing back. Uh, but I can fill in another collection. Uh, let's just try this one here. Um, number right, one from Europe. Um, and you actually see the, these bars here, they're not, um, not too far apart from the, uh, the previous collection. And I click identify again. It's a little less certain this time, but again, it has said, I think this collection is probably a burnium given what you've told me. But this is this is good um, because uh, this this collection really wasn't in the training set. The, the the machine hadn't heard of this collection at all, but it did correctly identify it as a burnium. And um, I should just just say um, for those who sort of know about these tools, that everything everything we're doing behind the scenes here is it's coded in Python, and the and the main machine learning tool we're using is, is PyTorch. Um, so. This is great so far. Uh, does it get it right every time is <laughs> a reasonable question. Uh, no, it doesn't, but it does pretty well. It, um, it puts the right species, i.e. matches the experts in, in around 75% of the time to 80% of the time it puts it as the top one species. But if you, if, you're, uh, if you accept being in the top five species, it gets it right around in our testing around 98 to 99% of the time. Um, and I will demonstrate a, a, a failure now. I know this one is difficult, and this one was in Asia. Again, click identify. Again, it was in Ibernium, uh, but the identifier thought this is probably Alpinum, which is, in, in a sense, it's a success for the identifier because um, those two are actually really quite uh similar species morphologically and 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 from a sequence point of view as well and um just to demonstrate if i just change one measurement this is how ornamented the spores are and actually abernium tend often to be what we call uh, this just the code um 03 rather than 92 if only there were one different and it actually would come to the top so um i think uh the the uh the identifier is doing pretty well I just, whilst I'm here, as we've put this, this tool, this website together, I wanted to demonstrate one more thing if I have time. Um, we basically are exposing the database, uh, all the information we've got in the database through the website. So this is just one super quick example that kind of intrigued me when I saw it. This is plotting every collection of Hebeloma that we have in Europe. Um, and we've chosen an access, axis of what year was it collected and then the day of the year it was collected. And just plot them all and just see what happens in this case um perhaps not surprising but what it's saying as time's gone on we're collecting hebeloma uh later in the year but in fact by one day a year every year well, getting close to one day a year just won't speculate here uh, exactly why that is but we'll have some guesses um yeah and so this is the kind of tool we want to put together and, and the people who are interested in this genus can come and just play around with the data we've got uh but yeah so what have we found about hebeloma yeah we found that the systematic approach about getting all the state all the to, to do machine learning you you need at least tens of thousands probably more points of data and, and that's what we've got on our database and it's, it's critical and and we're, we're quite excited about how how this approach this uh, uh character-based approach has has done so far uh, it seems like as we slowly gather more data, it's getting better, which is great. Um, and the next sort of big challenge is, well, we have a sequence data too. Can we bring everything together into one identifier? Uh, so that's something that we'll be looking at in the future. But for now, uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's great. It's uh, interesting. The project has been going so long. Are, are you the, I'm going to start by asking a question. Uh, are you the uh, creator and maintainer of the website and database and so on? Uh, 
Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, as I was saying, I was uh, a mathematician, so I was kind of interested in the, in the machine learning side and see if I could get that to work. And then, and then the rest of the team were, uh, oh, but we need some way to see this. So there was a sort of <laughs> bit of scrabbling around, can we get a website as well? Um, so I know it's not as, uh, you know, maybe fancy as some of the tools we've seen in the conference so far, but that's another area that we want to you know, build on as, as time goes on. Keep well, it's, it's fantastic to see what citizens can do. Tell me, tell me, t share one other thing. Why this particular group of fungi? What what motivated that, as opposed to other groups, for instance? Well, I I think the people who are in the project. I mean, I, maybe they speak to themselves been longer than I have, but there was a sort of certain challenge that uh, there's there's sort of the glamorous, uh, as we've seen from Australia. Uh, multicolored fungi and then sort of Hebeloma are, are maybe a little bit left behind they're the sort of the awkward brown ones that, that are at the bottom of the basket at the end of the foray and this <laughs> the team said like, well I, these guys deserve to be understood as well uh and and they kind of got into it that way as so I, I, I that's uh -huh. my sense all right we're open for questions we have some time here anybody else uh one of, there one was the one topics. from Dimitri. Um, Peter, very nice work. Can you tell me more about algorithms you used? So, um, yeah, the, 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 the CNN that we're using is uh, relatively simple. Um, so <laughs> we, we, we kind of treated what comes with PyTorch like a, a, as a sort of a, chop, uh, a sweet shop of different things to try. So the thing that we just saw online with there is a, a, a one hidden layer CNN. Um, is that? And then kind of as a follow-up, someone just asked, have you tried to transfer your algorithm to the other genre? How easy, difficult might this be um, because of what reasons? <laughs> okay, so I, we, have known before we started that if we selected uh, this set of characters, then they should work for Hebeloma. So if we tried to naively transfer to another genus, another family, then you would need to start with knowing what are your important characters. But if, if you did that, you know that then it, it may well work. Uh, um, there, it would be a step further to say, oh, ask the machine, please also, here are, here's everything I've got, just figure out the important characters for me completely. Uh, we didn't do that in this case. And then there's also another one. Is there a way for anyone to log in and try out the Hebeloma tool? Um, yeah, get in touch at the moment. Um, because we've we've been sorting out um, kinks and getting things working, we've had it that you log in rather than it being completely public. But um, if you send well me an email uh, or, or, or ping me in Hoover, then I'm sure we can uh, figure out a login for anyone who's interested. That's terrific. Thank you. Alrighty, I think we it's we need to move to our last presentation. This one is, has is a pre-recorded presentation because our speaker uh, had a vacation already planned by the time the schedule came out. Um, next up is uh, 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 Jacob Heilman Clausen's uh, presentation. It's about his work with a team in Denmark, and it's about their progress understanding, uh, creating and, and maintaining the uh, Danish fungal atlas. Give us just one second and we're gonna pull this up for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
So good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Jakob Heimann Clausen uh, speaking here from the University of Copenhagen, presenting uh, some highlights from the Danish Fungal Atlas. Um, I'm really happy to be here, even though though it's in in online format, but uh, it's a nice session, and I'm happy to participate. And thanks for the invitation for to the organizers. So the the Danish Fungal Atlas uh, originally started in 2009. But uh, building on an older internet recording platform for fungal records uh, made in Denmark. It was a five year project uh, running uh, with, uh, with two full time positions per year, but uh, distributed uh, over five professional mycologists. The project was started by Jan Westerholt, who some of you have met in the past. He unfortunately uh, died uh, during the project after only two years. Uh, it was a big loss for Danish mycology and, and mycology in general, but uh, he got this uh, idea to start this uh, fungal project and also got the funding to it. And it was really, yeah, so so it has provided some input that is still really making a difference uh, for mycology in Denmark. The main purpose of the original project was uh, basically to increase knowledge and awareness of macrofungi in the society and of course uh, with a specific fungus on nature conservation. So, so the, the foundation, the Oviensen Foundation that paid us was really keen that the, the information we collected should be made available uh, for nature managers taking more, more, more care of macrofungi than they normally do. And I think we have succeeded in that. Um, after the first project phase, uh, we realized that uh, we built uh, and success. There was a lot of interest in the project, and we were uh, happy, and lucky enough to, to get funding for five more years, uh, which involved the uh, uh, rebuild of the whole database structure and user interface involving Thomas Janik or Jebsen and Tobias Fosslev. So Thomas was the, 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 the computer guru that, that actually built uh, our new portal. Uh, we also had to make a book about the experiences we got from the, from the first project phase and uh, we provide identification keys. Uh, it's a project we're still working on coming up next year. And there's also some other aspects, including the development of native app for, for, for mobile phones. And there was not any specific goals in the project, but uh, I think unofficially we wanted to make them uh, the hotspot on the recording on the globe. And based on these figures from GBIF, it seems that we more or less succeeded in that. And zoom in on Denmark, you can see that Schizophilum commune, which is more or less globally distributed, has the most intensive recording in the Copenhagen area in Denmark and the globe. So we have really got a lot of hunger records going on in Denmark. The database is built up uh, on a taxon database that stores all the information of, of species in Denmark, including photos and distribution to specific morpho groups, and ecological roles, things, names, and so on. And of course, a user database that uh, stores our users and combine that with a date and a place on in Denmark, we have a record. And to these records, we add uh, uh, information about the habitat, substrate, there's a lot of photos associated with, with the records and so on. And then um, the taxon database is built on an index from Gorham, so we import our species names from, from that source to keep uh, connected to the global society of taxonomists. And we share our own database with GB on a weekly basis, and the same is the case for the records, so everything is available globally, all the time, and for research and nature management. Uh, for the users, uh, we have different resources, that is resources for hiding, I'm coming back to those, and then we have recording pages, and species presentation pages, and, and several other special features that users can go in a look at. The validation of records uh, is uh, built on a rather sophisticated uh, interactive uh, system. Um, it's made so that all users can vote for existing species IDs and they can also add new species IDs. So here we have a, a rather boring Cotinaria species where 
where you have you know, three different uh, IDs competing. You can see that they have different uh, weights here. Normally, well, not normally, but the concept is that if the, the score reaches 74, uh, it's uh, approved as a validated record. You can see here, I'm an expert, so I'm able actually to download the records also. I can see you have, you can see I have voted for this determination, um, but, um, but for normal users, it's only possible to upload reports. You cannot give a negative vote That's in order to keep a, a good and constructive environment among all users. But the validation can happen uh, through uh, by two different processes. The, an expert, and we are around ten of those, can can uh, make the, the final decision and say this is exactly that species. Or it can be done based on interactive uh, interactions between our users, combined combined with smart filters. And these uh, smart filters are taxon specific uh, based on the rarity of, of the, each species, uh, its geographical distribution and the phenology. So you need to, uh, if, if you want to have, well, so, so, so a, a record of the rare species in a region where it's never been recorded in the wrong time of the year is much more unlikely to be approved uh, compared to a record of a common species occurring in the exact right season in a known area. The, the weights are then also user specific. So if you have a lot of experience with bullies and a lot of approved records, you will have a higher weight. Uh, and it's also it's on, on species specific level. If you have many records of one species, it, it helps you to have a higher saying in, in, in the voting process. And uh, more than three fourths of our records are validated in the community. Uh, some are expert validated. And, and we also allow validation at a higher um, species level, for instance, at the genus level or just as a fungus of the species. So that's why we have such a high number of actively validated records, because we can say it's, we don't know exactly what it is. Uh, to to uh, give uh, some training to our users and build the community, we have annual recording camps. Uh, in the first phase of the project, we had two annual recording camps. And then we have a lot of dialogue in the microform with our users. So here's one example of a microform related to this Cosinaris species. And you can see that it's also possible to, 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 uh, to pin people to, to check, take a check on, on specific records and add their information to it. And that helps really uh, in having a, a good society. It's an extremely helpful resource. Then we have uh, identification keys. First, we used quite a bit the uh, micro key that some of you may know. And we also are working on these like atomic keys that uh, is more traditional, but well illustrated. So that's what we're going to print in a book, hopefully in one year's time. And then since 2019, we have species recognition based on artificial intelligence, um, which is available on this page or in our mobile app, the Swamba Atlas app that is free to download uh, for all, all sorts of of, uh, of uh, smartphones. Um, and it's uh, basically built by Czech uh, computer scientists. Uh, you can read more about the details in this paper. Um, it's trained on around 85,000 uh, images from our database, and it's able to identify around 1,400 species with, according to our, our testing, around 85% uh, security, so it's actually pretty amazing what it can do compared to to the challenges involved in with species identification. Uh, during the, the the time where we have been running this project, the, the the number of users and recordings have changed quite a bit. In, in the early phase, there was not that many users; only around hundred really dedicated people. With the launch of the fungal atlas, that rose to around 200 users per year. Uh, it was the same in the beginning of the fungal Atlas 2.0. The, the, the launch of the interactive validation processes uh, increased the number of, of users quite a bit, but it was really the native app with uh, this uh, AI identification tool that really boosted our number of users to more than 1,000 per year. And that's... Uh, helping us to have more and more records of fungi per year. And now we are reaching around 80,000 last year and 
maybe even more in, in, in 2021. But it also, this special native app uh, on the, for the mobile phone really changed the, the recording profile. So we have many more users that are not giving a lot of records, but just a few. So we are really changing from a small number of highly dedicated users that really know the system and are active in the validation process to many more users that are more loosely associated with the product. And that's a challenge because we have a lot of people that don't really play after the rules and where we have to use a lot of energy to try to, to learn them how to do things. So, so this success that we have with the native app is, is also a challenge. Very recently, we started sequencing quite a lot of our collections, uh, starting four years ago with, with science sequencing. So far, we have run around 400 collections based on that platform. And that has provided uh, relatively interesting results. More than 300 have had a very good match. Some were uncertain and we could also identify around 10 new species to science. We don't have described those yet. Some are being worked on by other people. Uh, but those with a good match, we can see that most represent well done Danish taxa. There's also quite a number of, of new records, so more than 100 uh, new, new species could actually be approved as Danish or confirmed as, as new Danish species based on, on this uh, sequence in approach. And uh, from this year on, uh, for last, from last year, we also started uh, testing a high throughput pipeline where we can now cost, uh, cut down the cost of sequencing to uh, a minimum. And we're just now preparing more than 1,000 collections for, for sequencing to really boost knowledge about the use of biodiversity. But just based on, on, on the first uh, Sanger sequencing approach, we, we could, uh, for instance, with a genus like Kudnam, really improve our knowledge a lot about what's going on in Denmark. Usually we, we accepted three species, uh, white, uh, yellowish, and, and, uh, and uh, cream colored. And uh, we also know that this, uh, this, this more cream to orange colored was basically three different species. In the case of the princess and the ellipsis form was also a proven before we had the ideas. But with these new tools, we could add four new species to, to the list. And actually, our fifth was added this year. So we now have 10 species compared to, to three species in the old days. Uh, so this is just one example. It's even more crazy what's going on in general, like cotton iris and, and inosity. We have published uh, some papers about the project. Uh, one, a standalone paper, is describing how the project has improved knowledge about microfungi in Denmark. Um, but we can see that the, that the number of, of known species is actually just increasing over time. It's not leveling out yet. Uh, and, and, and this is mainly related to uh, improved taxonomic knowledge and, and, and a clear effect of more search. So we even have species described as new, spe as new to science based on our recordings, and in this case, also a, a type specimen connect, collected in Russia. So, we can show with this project that citizen scientists can really boost knowledge about virus, even one of the most well explored and most uh, cultivated countries in the world. The data is used a lot in Denmark for nature conservation, both in, in the high nature value map, where you can see different areas with different colors, depending on how many threatened species they support. Uh, but also for systematic conservation planning as, as the, the designation of new nature reserves based on complementarity in species composition, not only built on fungi, but, but including fungal records to quite a high degree. We also made standalone research, uh, including 10 research papers that are fully partly based on the data. And, and when you look at it, you can see that there's more than 80 citations of the data set. So it's used a lot. So um, this was just a very quick uh, travel through the Danish Fungal Atlas. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions over the, the app or later on by email if you should be interested in all. So thank you for your attention and hope to see you in real reality in the physical world some, sometimes in the future. Bye bye.
All right, well, I want to thank our speakers uh, for their stimulating discussions about the conservation and um, biodiversity of fungi. I think we can, um, I, I wanna thank our, our, our uh, conference help, uh, both, both uh, uh, Avery and Katie are helping with the platform and Kevin and Lauren are helping with the, uh, with Zoom, and we appreciate that. Things have gone smoothly. Um, we, we have a little bit of time left. I was going to um, start the conversation uh, by talking about taxonomy. That's always a very big issue in biodiversity standards uh, conversations. And it seems like overall people are understanding that there's a lot to be learned and they're taking um, uh, uh, images, they're taking specimens, they have lots of suggestions. Many groups are, are doing sequencing. In fact, everybody mentioned sequencing. So a variety of approaches are being used and that seems necessary given um, uh, uh, how, much is, how much is to be learned. But I, I'd like to open up the conversation to the community and see what uh, thoughts they have about dealing with taxonomic change and um, how, how we can do a better job of linking um, images and sequences and morpho uh, uh, and specimens together. Well, what, one thing that struck me, Rob, is that uh, the uh, fungi area have always struggled to kind of do the task of describing the tens to hundreds to millions of, of, of fungi that are out there. And all of a sudden there's this great community network that's starting to contribute to that. So I think there's an important feedback loop now to institutions, whether they're specifically fungi area or their natural history collection institutions and say, you've got this incredible network of people out there. They are begging for you to do something about the taxonomy and to try and close the loop um, to complement the, the citizen science with the institutional science. Um, and things like, you know, Bill was mentioning the issue with collections and that reference collections might not be able to cope with the volume of material. I think that's actually a good problem to have to put to different institutions where maybe before they said, well, we can't get any fungal collections. Well, now there's people queuing up to provide them. So I think that there's a need now for dialogue with, with major natural history institutions around the world to get more mycologists in there and, and, and start uh, getting on because it, before the bottleneck was mycologists and collections, now the collection bottleneck is, is disappearing, but, but there's not enough mycologists. But that, that community interest is just so great. Um, I think that's, that's an interesting discussion to start to have. Anyone is uh, free to unmute themselves and chat if they'd like a little bit or put anything into um, the, the chat feature on Whova. We do have in, in the chat, we have a message from Carlos Martinez who, who uh, mentions the uh, idea of developing the open journal systems towards biodiversity data. So uh, he's thinking of, of infrastructure that can help help people Any any other uh, comments uh, from from people who've worked on other taxa about the state of of what's happening in the fungal world, or about uh, the feedback loops? Tom Tom mentioned more than one feedback loop. He mentioned one in his talk, and then he's mentioned this next feedback loop. We saw that in Jacob's. Uh, presentation when he talked about the release of the AI app and how that changed the dynamic by broadening the user base from people who were, we might call more serious uh, fungal people to a wider range of people, but starting to increase the, the number of specimens and the 
he didn't talk about the distribution, uh, uh, geographic broadening of specimens, but I expect that's also happening. Well, if, if I can pop another sort of part to this uh, uh, is, we've seen amazing systems being developed sort of locally. So that Danish system is, is fabulous. It's an integrated system all the way through from the recording through to, through to chats, through to validation and so on. And then Bill was talking about the, the, the last sort of map that he produced of, of the different things interconnecting and the programming that needs to be done. And if you think globally, well, there'd be hundreds of countries without the resources to set up their own you know, mycological recording sort of system. I mean, in effect, in Australia, we've just gone with our naturalists because we don't have the resources to build something, uh, basically. So it's an interesting question as to whether people can see some packages of evol evolving of, of the platform and the software and the connections that could be rolled out in, in other countries. Well, I think that's a very interesting perspective. You'll see that in the session on Friday at this in this same time slot that three or four people will talk about platforms that can support biodiversity. There's tension between um, uh, building generalized platforms. As you know, in Australia, you, you have the government there has, has um, supported the Atlas of Living Australia, which does a marvelous job. It's one of the leading pieces of software that's now being ad adopted in other countries around the world, which is um, uh, hopefully a, a good effect of globalization. Uh, and then uh, in Australia, they also have another piece of software that it can be configured for platforms called BioCollect. Um, but Peter also uh, supports, Peter Brenton, this is in Australia, also supports iNaturalist because it's become widely used as a tool. So the idea of marrying some of these more generic tools that can be configured for, for um, specific projects and can marry the, the, the generality of some software tools to some uh, specific communities that have the desire and the interest in, in specific tax, I think um, uh, we're seeing might, might be one way to go. We have lots of people from the museum world um, that attend this conference. Does anybody from the museum community want to comment on the um, the ex the widening, broadening of of the mission of the uh, those institutions to include more citizen science activities? I know many of them have taken up various citizen science projects, and iNaturalist itself is supported at a at a natural history museum. Um, any other comments about, about those communities and how they view uh, broadening the base of, uh, of recording? Um. In the Botanical Garden of Meze for the Day of Science in November, we will have a citizen science uh, activity to identify the, the mushrooms in our domain of 92 hectares. And we use a lot of uh, citizen science. Uh, so we had activities for, for plants, but uh, we will have special activity about the mushrooms. In, in our domain and it has very good uh, impact. We do uh, bio blitzes and people are very interested to, and we also work with iNaturalist. Thank you, Patricia. Is there um, any other comments along those lines? Is there, uh, opportunities to, to do more sharing of tools or strategies?
All right, well, uh, I just wanna thank the speakers then for their participation and, and bringing the fungal world to Tadwig for the first time. Hopefully in the future, we there are more people out there doing more things with fungi. They're such an important um, contributor to biodiversity and to ecosystem services um, by their very tight affiliation with plants. And they're so, in, so fun uh, to collect. There are many mushroom clubs around the world that I think there's continued opportunity to, to uh, expand uh, the contribution that, that, uh, that citizens are making to the uh, our knowledge about fungal biodiversity. Um, so uh, once again, thank you to the speakers and thank you to the University of Florida and the TAG, TADWIG for, for hosting this event. I, I should remind people that the event is recorded and will be available if, if you didn't have a chance to see it all or there are parts you wanna go back and listen to, it's, it'll be available through the TADWIG website. And um, thank you for attending and Contact the speakers if you have further questions. Thanks so much. Um, we have about, let's see, um, a five-ish minute break, and then it's going to go and ask Tadwig some questions. Um, we'll have VJ, Stan, Gail, James, Deb, and John. Um, so if you just go into your Whova app and you return to the agenda and rejoin that session, We'll get started there in about five minutes. And Cynthia, I see that you have your hand raised. You're welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like. <laughs> 